Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. Well, greetings, everyone. Welcome to Heartline Ministry. For the last week, uh, going into this week, we're going to be looking at the fruit of the Spirit. And the question is, if you were placed on trial for being a Christian, would they have enough evidence to convict you? We're going to talk about that as we started last week. Uh, continue this week to see, would there be enough evidence? See you in a bit. Well, once again, we want to thank you so much for tuning into Hotline Ministry. I am Pastor Harold Noyes, pastor of the Community Christian Church found in Athens, Vermont, on the Lower Road. And also alongside is my co-host, Pastor Timothy Golden, on, uh, pastor of Life on Main, though you're not going to be on Main very long. No, Life on Main's going off Main <laughs> in about <laughs> another week, yes. But you're going to keep the name, Life on Main. Anyway. We're going to keep the, yeah, because we're still on the main thing, and that being Jesus Christ. That's right, that's right. Jesus Christ is the main main thing and I and, and certainly during this program that's exactly what is our main topic is the mm -hmm. Lord Jesus Christ for sure last week Tim we started talking about uh, the fruit of the spirit which of course Paul kind of introduces after he talks about things of the flesh mm -hmm. envying and strife and so forth that, that he talks about and I preached a few weeks ago out of 1st John 2 out of this verse Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him mm. or her or them, whatever you, know, you want to use there. And we find that Paul goes in chapter 5 of the book of Galatians, which is where we are, chapter mm -hmm. 5, where he goes, says, you know, the works of the flesh are made known, verse 19, which are these, and he goes down with adultery, fornication, and so forth. And you know, where does that, how does that play into us, for example, loving the world? Mm. Is, that, is that playing into that? I mean, I know that we're all sinners. I know that we all have the, uh, the old nature in us. I know that even though we're born again, there's times that we slip and fall and all that thing. So what does verse 19 or 20 and 21 of Galatians 5, how does that apply here with the things of the flesh? Well, all those things, as you look at them, are very selfish-based. Um, I mean, whether you're talking about adultery, fornication, um, those things are about pleasing this body of mine, and it's giving into just cravings and impulses, and it's not being willing to sacrifice those things of the flesh for the sake of the things of the Spirit. Because as you said from that other scripture, you can't have both. It's got to be one or the other. These two things, and Paul talked about this, these are warring against each other. There's an actual battle that goes on between these right. things. It's not just a matter of, uh, I'd like to be able to have this in my life and that too. It's like these things are at, at odds with each other. And so we're one, it's very much like light and dark. They can't coexist. And so that's what he's saying here is that these things of the adultery, the fornication, the uncleanness, the lewdness, that's all acts of the flesh. They are things that are worldly from the standpoint that this world is now polluted by sin. And as we give into these things, we then are choosing at that point because we choose to embrace those things we're choosing to let go of the things that god desires because again they can't coexist you got to have one or the other i like that explanation of these in verses 19 20 21 cannot coexist with 
the fruit of the Spirit of mm -hmm. verses 22, 23, and for the rest of the chapter. And what I'm finding, at least I find, uh, as I look at Christianity and I look at, you know, the ministry and so forth, is that some people are living in this coexistence. Mm -hmm. I can live in the world, yet I am a born-again believer. I can, I can do these things, and God's grace is sufficient so that I don't have to worry about it. I mean, Paul certainly asked that question. Mm -hmm. Should we, uh, does, does sin abound that grace would much more abound? And of course, Paul says, of course not. You know, you cannot use the grace factor mm -hmm. and still live in sin. Well, to try to use the grace factor is just to admit exactly what side of the fence we're on. Yeah. Because by trying to just claim that, well, I can just do what I want because His grace is sufficient, you know, that He'll 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 forgive me, that shows the real attitude of my heart. The attitude of my heart is not to live according to His principles. The desire of my heart is I want to live according to my flesh, and then what I'm going to use, I'm just going to apply my get out of jail or get out of hell free card. Yeah, yeah. And that there shows my heart really isn't for Him. I really haven't made Him Lord and Savior. If I have then I want to live life pleasing to him. Am I always going to get it right? No. But my heart desires to want to please, not to make excuses. And that's the difference. So where we asked the question last week and asking the same question this week, if we were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict us? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm basing that on if I live in verses 19 to 21, there would not be enough evidence to convict me of Christianity. Right. If I live in, chap in chapter 5, verses 22 through 26, basically, mm -hmm. then there would be enough evidence to convict me of the fact that I am a Christian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the things that are listed in those verses are not humanly possible in our own strength. They right. require us. It requires our heart to be submitted to God so that his strength can help us live these things out. Well, Tim, I think uh, probably we need to open in prayer before we mm -hmm. go any further into our discussion so that we can uh, continue and, and be led by the Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to have you read uh, 22 to 26, okay? okay, in this portion. Father, we thank you so very, very much for the Apostle John, for his writings, for mm -hmm. him sharing with us these vital truths about how you provide the spirit that we can walk and live Christ. So, Father God, help us now to, to convey that, help us to talk about it, help our ears to be unstopped and our minds to be opened to hear what the spirit says. And, Father, we're going to thank you in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So starting at verse 22. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law, and those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Yes, and you know, one of the things, I think even before we go any further, because we had during the introduction, talked about, you know, verses 19 and 21 and, and the things of the flesh. But I think that we also need to be very, very careful. Let us not be desirous of vain glory. Mm. And to me, that's very important because how many people, how many Christians, if you look at verses 22, 23, go and say, see, I have conquered. See, look at me. Mm -hmm. See, I am better than everybody mm -hmm. else. No. We have got to make sure that that is not a part of a Christian's life. Yeah, Christians should never have the bumper sticker, I am humble and proud of it. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I knew a lady who would always say, and you know how humble I am right there, told me what <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> about that. So I think that, you know, looking at verse 26, let us not be desirous of vain glory. Right. Look at me, look how good I am, look at what I have accomplished. I have found, at least in my own Christian experience, when I start thinking that way, I am headed for a big fall. Yep. You know, matter of fact, there's a there's a uh, a quote that I got from Adrian Rogers, and it said this: "Secret faults that cause moral earthquakes." 
mm. secret fault that um, causes moral earthquakes. What happens? Here I am. I'm thinking I'm better than anybody else because I know how to, you know, I have love, I have joy, I have all these things, and therefore you don't, so I must be a stronger Christian than you. And that's not necessarily mm -hmm. true. It's just we got to be very, very yeah. careful of that. Because we're the worst judge of that. And it kind of brings us back to that question that you posed at the very beginning. Is there enough evidence to convict you? What do other people see? Yeah. What if, if some other witnesses were called on the stand to testify about your life, would they see these things in your life? You know, and I think that that is really more the telltale, not whether you think you've got them. Do other people see this in you? Because if so, you know, that's where the, the real truth is. You know, I, I think the end of verse 26, before we go back over to 22, the end of verse 26 is telling, provoking one another, envying one another. And wait a minute, is that, is that the cause of Christ? Or is mm. that our mission? I am to provoke you, to cause you to envy, or cause you to say, well, I wish I could be as Pastor Noise, or I wish I could mm. be as this. You know, and no, no, no. That, that is so against what the Scripture right. teaches us. You know, he says we are not to be a stumbling block mm -hmm. or a cause of offense mm -hmm. to anyone. Yeah. And, and I like the aspect there of don't envy one another. In other words, I see you walking more of the Christian walk. Do I envy you and how great a Christian you are? No, because then what's, what's the problem? I've got my eyes on you. Exactly. I don't have my eyes on Jesus. And, right. and so when it comes to whether or not we are succeeding in these things, I would even say we go even go further than just what do I see or what do others see? What does God see? Yep. If you were to go before God and say, hey, God, isn't it great? Do you see how good I am at loving people, how mm -hmm. good I am at being joy-filled? Just check it how awesome I am doing at this. Right. But what yardstick is Jesus using to measure it? Himself. Himself. So, I mean, we can't measure And we up. always fall short. Oh, sure. There's always can't. room for improvement. Right, right. You know, it's almost, and I've heard some people kind of not say it per se, but certainly um, bring out the aspect, boy, God, you're lucky I'm on your side. Yeah. You know, wait a minute. That is not the way it is. So let's go back, Tim, to verse 22, uh, the first three, which we spoke of last week, just to kind of, give the picture of the, the spirit of love is not the phileo love it's not the eros love but it is the agape love right which is the god-centered love you know when mm -hmm. john says in his epistle god is love he's not saying god is the phileo or god is the eros no he's saying god is the agape type love that is that mm -hmm. pure love that only god can give us mm. that that we have so so we have that the joy. Joy is more than happiness. Happiness mm -hmm. to me is the outward expression, but joy is the inward mm -hmm. expression of who God is. Yep. Happiness wears off. Joy does not. Mm -hmm. And then we have peace. Uh, certainly in this day and age, as we look at it, we as Christians need to learn what it is to live in peace. Why? Mm -hmm. Because we have the Prince of Peace living in us. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and Jesus even goes in verse 27 of John 14, you know, and, and just says, hey, wait a minute, what I'm giving you, I'm not giving you something that the world can give to you. I'm giving you something that is very, very mm -hmm. special. It is mine. It is of me. Mm -hmm. And that's what the kind of peace is that he's talking to us yep. about. You know, I mean, the peace that passes all understanding. Mm -hmm. I, I know that I've faced things in my life, you face things in your life, mm -hmm. where you just stand back after it's all taken place and say, wow, where did that peace come from? Where did that contentment mm -hmm. come from? Yeah. You know, normally I would have been pulling my hair out and normally I would have been doing this. And, mm -hmm. and, but God gave us great peace about it, great right. comfort. To me, I look at it as back when you read about the martyrs, for example, how the, the martyrs could die on their, you know, their cross, if it was, you know, whether, whether it means that they were on the hot tower or whether they were burned at the stake or whatever the case may be, but they would do it singing hymns. They would do it praising God. They would do it praying for their family. You know, how can they do that mm -hmm. if it was not the supernatural peace of God? Right. And, by the way, all of these are supernatural. Mm -hmm. 
and you alluded to that earlier, we cannot do this in ourselves. Right. So in verse 26, let us not be desirous of vainglory. Why should I have vainglory? I'm not doing any of it. Mm -hmm. It is God doing it, right? Just as he's the one who takes away, verses 19 through 21, mm -hmm. those things, those desires of our heart. He replaces them with the nine fruit of the Spirit, which mm -hmm. he now has given us. And last week we pointed out, it is fruit, not fruits. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it's all part of the same deal. You know, we have access to all of these things through God. And if we are living out the Christian life, it's not a matter of I'm going to have love, but I'm not going to have any joy. Yeah. You're going to have each of these. And now I'm not saying that we're going to have them all at the same equal measure. And that's part of the working out our salvation and understanding that this fruit's going to grow in us. And so we've got to allow God to do what he needs to do in each of these things. But all these things are going to be present in every believer's life. You're going to see it. And the more they walk with God, the more you're going to see these right. things. Right. So, so that's the thing. And remember, we did a, we did a segment last week um, to, um, just to, to let people know about Pastor Sherm and, mm -hmm. and his influence in our lives and, and also in this ministry, helping us form, form this ministry how one of his favorite sayings was application is everything. Mm -hmm. If we don't apply the love, if we don't apply the joy or the peace or long suffering and mm -hmm. all the others, then what's going to happen to it? If you don't use it, you're going to do what? You're going to lose mm -hmm. it. It's not going to be right. present in you. It's not going to be um, usable in us because we won't know how to use it. Mm -hmm. So we need to be continually doing this. And I like the scripture you brought out earlier, working out your own salvation. Now, he's mm -hmm. not saying working for your own salvation. Right. No, it's working out that which God has done yep. in your deliverance. Mm -hmm. You've been delivered of the things of verses 19 to 21. Yep. Now I'm going to replace it with these things. That's right. And now you need to apply them. You need to appropriate them in your life. Mm -hmm. You know, and even if it means, you know, before you... You know, you get up in the morning, if you're just laying there trying to get the cobwebs out, Lord, help me to love a little better today. Lord, help me to be more joyful today. Lord, help me to be kinder today or living in more, you know, mm -hmm. a, a, a more of a uh, sincere peace today, whatever the case may mm -hmm. be, you know, or all of them. If mm -hmm. you want to quote all of them, say, Lord, help me to live in these better today than I did yesterday. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing with these, and, and I think we alluded to this last week, again, remember, these are the fruit of the Spirit. This isn't the gifts of the Spirit. Right. These things are not given, they're grown. And, in fact, we've all heard the people that have said, you know, referring, in fact, it could be one of the next ones we talked about, um, you know, it seems like every time I pray for patience, everything goes wrong. Right, yeah. Well, there's a reason for that. You're praying for the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit grows. Well, how do you get more patience? patient <laughs> other than being placed in situations that are going to require that right, right. How, how do I get more how, how do I express more love other than being placed in situations where I have to go beyond my own capability you know so if there's going to be some conflict that's going to arise how am I going to get more joy yep by being placed in situations that might want to try to rob me of that yeah, and matter of fact, we know grow. John 10, 10, right? The thief cometh not but to steal and kill and destroy. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, that would be trying to um, take away these or to alleviate these nine yep. fruit of the Spirit that are in us. Mm -hmm. you know, and, I think and that's where the application comes in because the then we have to appropriate it yep. in the midst of that. And that's where, for example, where Jesus goes and says, I am the vine, you are the branches. So what does that mean, I have to be? Mm -hmm. I have to be... Um, connected mm -hmm. to the vine mm -hmm. in order to get what I need to be able to live these things. Right. If I disconnect myself from the vine, who is Jesus Christ, then these things are going to wilt and die. That's right. It's just, to me, it's Fact just that life. simple. Mm -hmm. It's just that simple. So, so we're going to do that. So we've talked last week about the love, joy, peace. Now, long-suffering or suffering long. Mm -hmm. Um, patience, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, 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 I like it because I look at it and say, okay, God is going to give you long suffering and he's placed me in your life so that, hey, I'm going to help you to appropriate this yeah. patience. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, a suffering long kind of thing. <laughs> and it may be yeah. a longer trial than you think. <laughs> but, but, you know, so, so explain that. You know, what is patience? I mean, yeah. so many of us pray for patience. You know, mm-hmm. so many of us lack it sometimes. Mm-hmm. I know I do. I want everything done yesterday or the day before. Yeah. Um, you know, so mm-hmm. what is this patience that he's talking well, about? Well, I think there again, I, I, and I think this is where really the King James, the New King James, and some of the other translations really get it right or get it better. Yep. Versus some of the others. Because, you know, some use the word patience. I feel that's too shallow of a term. Because, you know, I can have patience waiting for my dinner. Yeah. Dinner's not a bad thing. But I can have patience because I'm, I'm just having to wait a little while. This concept of long suffering, or as you so rightly put it, to suffer long. Yeah means I am finding myself in a situation that requires patience because there's pain attached to it. And, and, you know, this is not just waiting for something that, you know, waiting for Christmas to come. I have patience, you know, that's an application of patience, but not necessarily an application of long suffering. You're not suffering for a long period of time waiting for Christmas to come. It's a little inconvenient, maybe, but that's it. But this concept of suffering long is finding yourself in a place of conflict, in a place where there's something coming against you, mm. maybe even something trying to come against you spiritually. And will you do what's required to maybe have to suffer long in the midst of that? Um, it might be a level of persecution that's going on. Um, are you going to suffer long for the sake of Christ in the yeah. midst of all of that? And so that's much deeper than patience. And so I think that's really what it's calling us to, is are you willing to forego? Because usually the suffering has to do with my temporal self. It has to do with my flesh. There's something in my flesh that's having to suffer. But am I willing to let that part suffer for the sake of something that's greater, something that's eternal, something spiritual in nature? And so people undergoing persecution may find themselves having to do that. I'm willing to, to withstand what I've got to go through in the physical, or like you said, people being burnt at the stake or yeah. tarred and feathered, whichever the case was for them, um, they were willing to go through that. They suffered long because they saw something greater. That's where their right. patience was rooted. Yeah, so so their eyes were focused. And, and we have talked on previous uh, programs about this. Are we looking at the eternal, mm-hmm. or are we looking just at the temporal? And to me, the long suffering would be more of the eyes on the end prize, mm-hmm. the eyes on the eternal, yep. as opposed to that which is temporal. Um, I was thinking of the analogy also of long suffering is, um, you know, when my father in law, for example, went and had uh, quadruple bypass, and, and, you know, we were like 12 hours before we heard from the doctor. And the first couple of hours weren't too bad, but then you start chewing on your fingernails and you start doing this and you start wondering, okay, I hope he's okay. We haven't heard anything. And you start pacing and you start doing mm-hmm. that. You know, to me, that would be, you know, a, a maybe a bad example of long suffering, but it seems like every hour that passes, the pain becomes greater and greater and greater mm-hmm. because you're wondering what's going to happen, what is happening, what is going mm-hmm. on. And, you know, and that happens in yeah. all of our lives concerning certain things. I remember hearing a story r- relayed about... Um, a child who had misbehaved. And so the teacher's way of disciplining... My father talked to you? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, th- this was be- uh, when they weren't allowed to use the rulers and things like that on the knuckles. But um, this one teacher, what she would do is, if a kid misbehaved, you stood up in front of class and she put two books in your hand. Thing is, you had to have your arms out like this. And she put one book in each hand. They weren't heavy books, but put a book in each hand. It's like, so how heavy? And she asked at the beginning, so how is that? Oh, this is nothing. But then she came back 10 minutes later. It's like, so how's it going with those books? They're getting heavy. Well, obviously the weight of the books hasn't changed. The weight of the books is still the same. But the length of time that you're there holding those books, right. they begin to really take a toll on you. Yeah. And, and they begin to feel heavier even though they're not. And, and it's very much, I think, the same thing in our yeah. lives when we go through, the, through different conflicts. You know, We have maybe what it takes to withstand at the early stages, but as it continues on, where does our strength come from? Yeah. I look to the hills from where does my help come. My help yeah. comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven. Psalm 121, yes. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful psalm. So long-suffering. 
do we possess or, or have we activated mm-hmm. the long suffering fruit of the spirit in us are yeah. we willing to say Lord no matter what it takes mm-hmm. you know um, some people would even say I mean because John the Apostle in his epistle since I'm preaching on that it's very fresh if these are the last days and long suffering is how long you know like John says mm-hmm. how long even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Yep. But it seems like every day, especially the way the world is going, we're wondering, oh, how much longer? Mm-hmm. How much longer? How much longer? And you know that can be a part of that long suffering. Yeah. You know that we're looking at, saying, Lord, even so, come quickly. I don't mm-hmm. know how much more I can take of this. Yeah. You know this kind of situation. So, you know, but are we as Christians willing to suffer long for the Lord Jesus? You know those little, those little quickies. You know that we do well. That's not long suffering, you know. Mm-hmm. But this is this is as you're walking in the Christian life, and these things are, you know, they're, they're constantly plaguing you or constantly mm-hmm. a part of your life. The long suffering. Yeah, you get that. And it reminds me of Christ, you know, when it, and that famous passage where it says that for the joy that was set before him, Even he endured the cross. Yep. You know um, that there was a joy that there there was something. His, his ability to suffer long in the midst of all that was because he had his focus yeah. beyond the immediate right. pain right. Uh, to something that was greater. Oh, with Paul, for me to live is Christ yeah. and to die is gain. Perfect. Right? And, and that's exactly, that, mm-hmm. that we, our purpose or our focus, excuse me, needs to be on the eternal. Mm-hmm. And I think that that has to do with any of these fruit yes. of the Spirit. If I'm going to love a person, Paul even says that we have to love the unlovable. Why? Mm-hmm. Because there's an eternal purpose for this. There's an eternal mm-hmm. uh, consequence for this if we don't. Yeah. And, and therefore, we're able to. You know, mm-hmm. the same thing with joy and peace, long suffering. How about gentleness? That's something that seems to be eluding our world today as a form of gentleness. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, you know, it seems like people are, are a little more, that's the word I want, just, just hard. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. they, they've become hardened, and whether it be in hate or, or, or dislike or whatever mm-hmm. word you want to use, it, people just seem to have been hardened lately. Mm-hmm. You know, not using gentleness. Yeah. When I think of gentleness, I think of <clears throat> playing a guitar, though I do not play one, and for a good reason. Yeah. I haven't been able to get past the frets with the fingers, you know, and because my fingers are tender or gentle in a sense, right? And that's really what that gentleness is talking about. Speaking of tenderness, um, that you're much more um, sensitive uh, to what is going on around you. You're more sensitive to the people that you're coming in contact with. Um, you know, what happens is, is what allows a person to be able to play guitar is they have to develop something on their fingers called calluses. Calluses, yeah. And what it does, it toughens the skin to the point that you don't feel like you did before. And what God's calling us to be is not calloused, you know, in, in this aspect of being gentle. We, he wants to keep us pliable. Now, is, just, just to, to bring this out, um, you play a, play a wonderful piano. Mm. And I notice as you play the piano, uh, there's a gentleness of your fingers hitting the keys. Mm-hmm. Um, is that a part because you're not pounding on them? That's right, because if you just pound on them, all you got is a lot of noise, yeah. really. I mean, it's the same notes, but it sounds very, very different. Yeah, but there's a gentleman. I can mm-hmm. just, you know, when I watch you move your hands, mm-hmm. you know, you're just barely touching them and, you mm-hmm. know, making them yeah. move like that. And, and that's it a- makes the music come alive. Yeah. And when we treat people with that kind of gentleness, what happens is they come alive. Yeah. When we don't treat them with gentleness, it's just a bunch of noise, really, to God, what, what we're doing. And we see a lot of Christians do this. We might say spiritual truths, but we don't bring it in a way that's going to bring life to a person. It's, you are going to hell, you dirty, filthy scumbag. Yeah. <laughs> right? And so what's that doing? That's that pounding. You know, how is it that we can woo them to the Father? You know, and I'm not saying water down the gospel. Right, right. We must call sin, sin. We must identify it for what it is. Yes, are people going to hell? Absolutely. But how am I, how am I presenting that? Am I presenting it? You are going to hell, you dirty, filthy sinner. Or is it, 
you know, I love you. I know what lies in store if you don't give your life to Christ. And I, I'm going to heaven. I want you to be there with me. You know, totally different attitude, same principle. Yeah. But I don't want you going to hell. I want you in heaven. You know, and because that's where God is, and that I want to be there with you. You know, there's a scripture verse that comes to mind: is um, to have friends, you got to show yourself friendly. Mm. You know, and to me, that is that is so alive. Yeah. Where you know, if, if you're going to be rude and obnoxious and painfully whatever, um, probably your number of friends is going to be very minimal, mm -hmm. uh, and close friends are going to be even more minimal. Mm -hmm. But God does say that we, in order to have friends, we, in true friends, he's talking about true friendship, mm -hmm. then we need to be a true friend. Yep. Now, like you say, that does not mean we want it on the gospel. It does not mean that we poo-poo sin or that we just kind of gloss over sin. No, no, no. We cannot do that. We must not do that. Right. But I, on the other hand, um, I'll give you an example, and you can follow the same example because you've just been through it. Um, I did a lot of funerals uh, in my early ministry and, and mm -hmm. things. But, you know, I wasn't able to really sense what the people were going through mm -hmm. during that time until my dad died. Mm -hmm. And when my dad died and I went through it, yeah. my, I think my presentation of working funerals and doing funerals changed immensely. Mm -hmm. Why? Because now I've been there. Yeah. Now I know what you're facing. It's the same thing with cancer. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, I face cancer. So I, when I deal with cancer patients and I deal with people going through cancer, I can say, yeah, I've been there. I know what it's like to have these injections or I know mm -hmm. what it's like to have these chemos or whatever the case, because I've been there. And, you know, to be able to be friendly, to be a friend, mm -hmm. to be able to say, look, I've been where you're at. Mm -hmm. And this is how God delivered me. Mm -hmm. And this is what God did to help me to get through this mm -hmm. and to be able to relate it that way instead of pounding on their head and calling them dirty, rotten sinners. No, this is what God mm -hmm. did with me, and I know he'll do the same for you. That's it. And that gentleness really kind of, it's really birthed out of, if we kind of back up a little bit, to the kindness, mm -hmm. right? Because you, you you'll never be able to be gentle unless you're first kind, right? which is really coming down to an attitude of the heart Heartline Ministries, right? Yeah, Heartline Ministries. <laughs> and, uh, but it, it's that willingness to want to treat people in a way that will be um, healthy for them and healthy for us. And so the outflow of that kindness will be gentleness. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I just, I mean, it can't help but as you're going through the Gospels and you're watching Jesus, you know, and I read Scripture as if I'm watching him work and move and mm -hmm. have his ministry. You know, it's not just words I'm reading. I, I try to picture, oh, Jesus is walking to Samaria and he's going to stop at a well and he's going to talk to a woman who's had five husbands and the man she's living with is not her husband. And he's going to draw her mm -hmm. to himself. Yeah. And how does he do that? He asks mm -hmm. a question. He poses, wait a minute, you know, there's something that you can do for me. Mm -hmm. I need a drink of water. But there's something I can do for you, and I can give you a greater mm -hmm. drink of water. Yeah. And that's me. And yeah. that kind of thing. You know, and, and to me, that's what this, this gentleness mm -hmm. is all about. And if people want to get a really good view of how this is lived out, and I now granted, just like anything that's released uh, through multimedia, there's going to be some what they call, um, you know... Uh, Licensor. Yeah, it's a kind of free licensing yep. and liberties that they're going to use. Um, but there's a, a actually the first largest crowdsourced uh, Christian series out right now called The Chosen, yeah. which does an incredible job, I think, of helping us understand this concept of gentleness because of the way that they portray Jesus throughout this um, series. They've only released two seasons. There's going to be like seven seasons all together. They're working on the third one now, but you see so many times this aspect of, they use the example of the woman at the well, which is kind of what brought yeah. that to my mind. And you see this aspect of Jesus never compromising, never showing kind of a wishy-washy view of who he is as being God, but meeting people right where they are, yeah. feeling with them, and, and in a gentle way, bringing them to God, bringing right. them to the Father. Yeah. And, uh, and so it really gives us a real good view of that, how, how to balance this aspect of 
being gentle but still being firm in your faith. Because I know that when, I mean, Jesus was about to end his conversation with the woman at the well, mm -hmm. and he exposes her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know you've had five husbands, and the man you're with is, is not your husband. And then he goes, but what does he go? He goes and says, go and sin no more. Mm -hmm. You know, so, <clears throat> excuse me, so he, it's not like he was, he was oblivious of her sin or anything. Mm -hmm. He knew of it. Mm -hmm. but he was able to go and say, look, this is what I can give you, and I promise that if you take this, you won't go and sin no more. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of a thing, right. that, kind of, that kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. Let's get into goodness, because we only got about five minutes left, according to Colin. Um, so we're only, only going to get into the sixth one, which means next week we'll get into the last three. Mm -hmm. But what is goodness, Tim, uh, as you see it? Goodness is really coming down because lots of people, um, self-included for a long time, just think, why well, say kindness and goodness? They both kind of sound like yeah. the same thing. But goodness is dealing with a level of moral excellence. And, of course, who's morals? Yeah. That's what you have to come back to. And this is where we've got to be careful because we're living in a world where we're saying there's no absolute morals. We're saying everything's relative. But we've got to come back to understanding that God says there are absolute morals. Right. And what are those morals? It's the morals that he, as the king of creation, has set up and has revealed to us through his word. So this is the righteous standard. The word of God is the righteous standard by which we live. And that is what measures the goodness. Not the world, not tolerance. It's whether or not our lives line up with what God expresses in his word. And as we live out that righteousness, that is that, that's what it's refer, referring to as that goodness. Yeah, so when I look at that goodness, uh, I look at the end of verse 23, against such there is no law. Right. And, and I love that because you take all nine of these fruit of the Spirit in, in, in respect now to goodness. God says, look, you do this, then that which the law does, what, do, what, what is it that the law was created for? The law was created to reveal our sin. Mm -hmm. And the law was created to reveal our sinfulness. He says, if you live in these six, actually all nine, but as we are in these six, ending with the goodness, if you live in this, look, you're not going to be breaking that law. Right. You're going to be living it. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and do you find it interesting that the first four had to do with our relationship with God in the last six has to do with our relationship with people. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? It is. God even put more stock, the way I'm seeing it, in how we treat each other. Mm -hmm. Because he says, the first, you know, first four of mine, now these last six. This is how I want you to treat each other. Mm -hmm. But then he even elaborates, though, to help us understand that really, though, it's all, all about ten him. are about him because he said, whatever you do for the, to the least of these, right. you've also done to me, yeah. whether it's meeting the need or whether it's not meeting the need. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and so even though those last six are dealing with people, as we're doing to them, we are doing unto him, right. is what he is saying. So, uh, I think sometimes goodness, and we'll have to end with this, but sometimes goodness has to do with, with uh, playing hardball. Absolutely. Because, you know, instead of enabling somebody to continue in their sin or whatever it is, mm -hmm. sometimes you have to say no. Mm -hmm. You know, these are some of the things that you need to work mm -hmm. out yourself. I can't do this for you anymore. Mm -hmm. I heard a pastor put it this way once. Said, it's not whether or not what you say is nice or it's mean, nice or hard. Yeah. What it really comes down to is does it bring life or does it bring death? Right. Exactly. Because there's sometimes where being gentle can actually bring death to somebody. Yep. By not calling somebody on their stuff can enable them. Right. You know, and can actually lead them down a dark path. And so we're actually doing them more harm by not being hard. Yep. And, but again, what's in our heart, you know? I have this phrase sometimes I use around our church. Our people are always like, they've gotten used to it. And they've learned that it basically means buckle your seatbelt. Yep. And it's yep. a phrase, you know I love you, right? Yep, yep. And because I want them to understand, look, I'm getting ready to say something, but I want you to know the heart it's coming from. I'm not doing it to condemn you. I'm not doing it to, to, to point a finger. I'm doing it because I love you. Yep. And if I don't do this, I'm not loving you. Yep. Just like with a parent raising their child. Who's the greater parent, the, child, the parent that disciplines their child or the one that lets them do what they want? Yeah. So do you find it interesting that goodness comes after gentleness? Because mm. I think there's sometimes that God says, but there are times you have to play hardball. Mm 
mm-hmm. you know, and but you do it with a with the right spirit. Yeah. You do it with the right heart, mm. and that is that is what matters. We're going to end with number six next week. We're going to we're going to finish. I hope the uh, the fruit of the spirit and go through to the end of this chapter. But I hope that this has been helpful to you. Would there be enough evidence as you read the first six, or actually all nine, but the first six? Is there enough evidence in your life to convict you of being a follower of Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. I hope there is. I'm Pastor Harold Noyes, pastor of the Community Christian Church. We're located on the Lower Road in Athens, Vermont. We have morning worship, 9.30 on Sunday morning. We have evening worship, 6 p.m. on Sunday nights. We have Bible study during the week. We have prayer meeting at 7 on Wednesday night. And if you're in the area, we'd love to have you stop in and say hi and, and just chat and spend some time with us. And if you're in the Charlestown area, Life on Main is still on Main for one more week. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, as of, and so that's at the 276 Main Street Abundant Life Center, Sunday mornings at 11. After that, starting September 19th, you'll be able to find us at the Charlestown Senior Center, which is located at 223 Old Springfield Road. Again, that starts on September 19th. Same bat time, same bat channel. As far as the uh, times of the services, still have coffee hour at 10, service at 11. Hope you can come out and join us. We also have prayer meeting on Wednesday nights. That will continue at the Abundant Life Center at 276 Main Street, 630. Regardless um, which Christian church you go to, we invite you to come and be a part of that. This is not about life on Main that day. It's about the kingdom of God. That's right. And so we want to encourage you to be a part of that. Um, but again, thank you so much for tuning into this program. We are hoping, as Harold said, that it is a real benefit to you. Let people know if it is, and be willing to share about uh, where they can tune in. If you're in the, uh, what is the eastern part of Vermont, Vermont in the Hampshire. western part of New right. Hampshire, um, you can find us on all, um, pretty much all the Christian, or all the Christian, all the community uh, stations. Uh, you can also find us on the web at fact eight, the number 8com or um, on our YouTube channel by simply going to bit.ly slash Heartline Ministries. Um, or you can also find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Heartline Ministries, and all the episodes are there as well. Let us know where you're tuning in from so we can keep your area up in prayer as well. Thank you so much for watching Heartline Ministries. It's